Hello. Welcome back. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Welcome to our next session. A damn, uh, um, a damn journey that has touched all sorts of disciplines. Uh, uh, we're joined by Emily Wittenberg, archivist at the American Film Institute, and Garrett Sayre, Senior Account Executive at Orange Logic. Um, don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. Emily and Garrett, over to you. All right, thank you, Graham. Appreciate it. So, hello, all. It's uh, in the M&E &E space, it's easy to have that feeling that you're not getting the most out of your archive. You have all this valuable content that tells the story of your company, of your organization, and you feel that that story isn't being told to the fullest, and, and whether your content's well-organized or muddled or whether it's being reused effectively or, or left on the shelf collecting dust, your, your content does have a pulse, right? And our speaker for this session uh, will be diving into how to activate your content to transcend beyond simply sitting in a system uh, she spent some time at the Huntington, at Fox, doing some freelance work, and has spent the last eight years as an archivist at the American Film Institute. And she'll be taking us through how AFI leveraged uh, a transformation in damn technology to bring its content to life. So I have the pleasure of introducing an Orange Logic faithful uh, who has a yearning for learning, Miss Emily Wittenberg. Thanks, Garrett. Um, my name is Emily Wittenberg, and I'm going to be presenting to you all about um, our journey with or Cortex Orange Logic and our digital asset management system here at the American Film Institute. Uh, so, as I said, my name is Emily Wittenberg, and I manage all of the historical materials relating to the history of AFI, things that were made for and by us, but then also the history of cinema that we've collected over our 50 year history. Um, that includes manuscript collections, audio video materials, student films, digital collections. I also manage all the digitization of those collections to get them from an analog, unusable, unviewable format to a more usable, digital friendly format. In addition, I also administer the enterprise level digital asset management system. So a little bit about our collections. We have over 1 million photographs, which are um, in the formats of print materials, black and white negatives, color slides, as well as born digital content as well. We also have over 24,000 audio and video elements, over 6,000 screenplays, over 3,000 AFI conservatory films, over 2,000 AFI conservatory seminars, which is very unique to us, um, over 250 oral histories, and over 600 linear feet of manuscript collections. We had a lot of challenges and needs when we were looking at what digital asset management system would work for us. Um, one of our primary goals was to break down silos. Our, our most prescient example of this was our photo archive. Our digital photo archive was only viewable on one computer using one program with one seat. So we could never have concurrent users either searching for photographs or even helping to manage those photographs. It was really only contained to one sphere and we really needed to uh, break that down. Um, we also do a lot of file sharing throughout our organization. We have a, we use a lot of things and we reuse a lot of things. So um, photographs would be used by creative services. They could remove dust from a photograph, save it on their computer as their final file. And only people who knew that they had worked on that photograph or had seen that beautifully crafted photograph could know where to go to get that updated version. So we really needed a, um, a system that could help us easily share finalized versions across our organization. We also really wanted to lift the veil on the collections. Um, a lot, I would hear constantly the refrain of, well, we don't know what we have. I don't know what we have. Um, so having people have a system where they can go to a central repository and view all the materials in one spot really helps to under help them understand just what those collections are and how deep and wide they are and how much they can reuse them and use them in their work um, and make their work more powerful. Uh, we also really needed enhanced technological tools because we have so much media um, and we really look within the content. So it's not just about um, the piece itself, but what are they saying within the content? So we needed speech to text captioning that was time code specific. Um, we also needed facial recognition and things like that that could really help us with our content. Uh, we also needed a repository that would help us put in detailed metadata so that everything was searchable and findable from the get-go. 
Uh, these are just some common questions that I get as the archivist at the American Film Institute. Um, and really, I am the only person who can answer any of these questions. So anytime anyone has this question um, or something similar, they have to come to me and I really have to do a lot of research in order to help them understand what they're looking at. Um, one of the most primary examples is the last one. So um, for instance, if I have a photograph of Gene Kelly and he's with another person, um, if I don't, if it's not previously identified, but maybe I know who that person is, I am the only person that knows that information. So I really wanted a central repository to be able to um, get that information outside my head and into the hands of others. Um, so primarily what we use is a lot of metadata, right? Um, so all of the screenshots that you'll see from here on out are screenshots of our digital asset management system. And this is our primary um, details tab within the system. Um, all of these fields are completely customizable. I can change and craft how they look, in which order they appear. Um, and what I really love about it is that we could put in a lot of our institution specific needs within the system. So it wasn't just trying to curtail our, our, our data to fit something else. We really could make it our own and put in all those unique values that we as an organization, as an organization really needed. The other thing I really wanted was consistency and a controlled vocabulary because um, a lot of us can define something in either a similar way or a completely different way. So it was really important to, for me, to have consistent, um, easy to use a vocabulary that's ready to go. So um, the left-hand screenshot is our source formats for all of our um, uh, analog uh, tape elements. So again, just making sure that everything is uh, put together in the same way so that everybody can um, get to what they need to. Um, same thing with subjects. Subjects were really important to me as well. Um, we define our film and television titles in all caps. So again, that's a really good visual reference point so that someone knows it's not a person's name or how is this title spelled? Is there a comma? Is there a question mark at the end of the title? We're really kind of making sure that everything is consistent throughout so that there's no, um, there's no inconsistency and there's no um, extra thought that needs to go into, did I search this right? Um, you also have a lot of custom display and linked data. Um, so the screenshot on the right are, is the overview panel for Diane Carroll's 1974 audio seminar that she came and conducted um, at the American Film Institute. I couldn't resist and I had to put one of her stunning photos in as a representation um, because they're gorgeous and it should be shown. Um, but what I really wanted to highlight on this screen are all of the blue that you see there on the right hand side. Those are all linked and clickable metadata fields. So these are all um, things that I applied in that previous screen. But let's say you want to go down a rabbit hole and you're obsessed with Porky and Bess, or you really want to learn more about, um, you know, working as a minority filmmaker, all of that you can click on. And then instead of having to do a brand new search, you get to all these search queries that also are tagged with that same piece of information. So again, you can have a big exploration of the system and of the content, which was really important. Uh, search and retrieval, just a little bit of the features. Um, I really love the autofill predictive search feature. So here I've started typing in Steven. Um, I really love it because it can also, it not only does first names, but also just last names or any part in which Steven would appear, um, which I really love. Um, again, helping the people so that if they don't know how to spell Steven Spielberg, Spielberg can be a, um, sometimes a clunky word to spell if you're not familiar with it there you have it right in front of you and you don't have to guess and you don't have to say well maybe i spelled that incorrectly so that's why i'm getting so few results you're really um the guesswork is taken out um and then on the right we have our filters kind of showcased so here i've done a search for janet lee um on the right hand side of this panel you can see that you can filter out by format of material so if someone is looking for a video of Janet Lee, they can just click on that video filter and it's they're only going to see the videos in which she is tagged, which is again a really good robust feature as we grow the assets, as you can tell from the, the depth of the collections. Um, there's a lot of assets that are going to go into this so having that filtering system is going to get really important as we get more and more content within the dam. 
what I also really love about the dam, I will say the word love a lot, um, are the expected and the unexpected results. So um, for our users, so often they'll ask for film specific references of what materials we might have that are um, going to represent what film they're researching. So here I've done a search for the film Close Encounters. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see what you'd expect. You would expect Steven Spielberg, right? Um, so this is his 1978 seminar that he gave. And these are the various, um, these are the various uh, assets associated with that seminar. Um, but what I really want to expose people to and show them are the what they wouldn't maybe not expect. So here we've got um, three cinematographers and Jessica Alba, right? So in this AFI 100s interview, Jessica Alba is talking about watching Close Encounters as a child with her brother. And it's a really sweet um, reminiscence. And um, I just really love that because I think so often in our day-to-day -day lives, we look at everything and we're only saying, oh, well, I expect Steven Spielberg, that's who I'm gonna go to. But I really wanted them to show um, and see how much more content they can use. Um, I also really like the related assets. So um, here I have clicked on the 1978 video of Steven Spielberg, which you can play directly from that that screen right there. Um, but let's just say that the video quality wasn't very good or you had trouble listening to it um, and you wanted to, you know, have it in a different format. So here, right below that video piece, you've got related assets. So I linked all of those other assets that are associated with this same event, rather than the user having to go back out to their search results. Um, maybe again, they went down a rabbit hole to find this and they want to know what else we have here. They can see it right here. And we've got audio elements and a printed transcript that are also associated with this same event. Uh, and then there's the speech to text captioning. Again, this was really important for our organization. So this is Domi Shi from in a 2023 seminar, um, and she came for the film Turning Red. But she also talked about her film, um, her short film Bao, um, which is again where the caption management comes in. So you can see here um, that on the right hand side we've got an example of what that caption management looks like. Um, in the second. Um, section, we've got um, reference to the film Bao. Um, well, when the system has had first processed it, um, it, it interpreted that word as B-O-W, but I can go in and I can edit as I did here and make sure that the film title is represented correctly. Um, we can also change the caption track from English to French, to Spanish, to Japanese, again, helping our international cohort, of which we have a lot, um, really understand and, and engage with the media as we've never been able to do prior. Uh, and then we are able to search within the speech to text caption management, which is, again, one of my favorite features of the system. Um, so on the left hand side, I've done a, a search for lighting techniques. We get all the cinematographers as we would expect. Um, and then from there, I can click in. So I've clicked on the John Alonzo 1974 seminar. I've gone directly to the caption management. I've searched for the term lighting. And then I have all the time coded pieces in which he says the word lighting. So again, this is really a robust feature that can help our users more efficiently get to the piece of information that they're looking for. And then facial recognition. So this, it behaves differently with photography and video. Um, so this is my example with the photography. So um, on your left-hand screenshot, this is a really good example because it showcases all the features of the facial recognition. Um, so the green box around Frank Sinatra's face, that is a confirmed face. I know that, that is Frank Sinatra. But the blue box around Clint Eastwood's face, that tells me that the system thinks hey, I think I've seen this face before and I had previously identified it as Clint Eastwood. Can you please confirm, is this Clint Eastwood? All I do is I click confirm on Clint Eastwood and then the blue box changes to green, confirming that that is indeed Clint Eastwood. But the gentleman um, uh, on the over the shoulder of Frank Sinatra, his box is orange. That means that the system has never encountered this face before and I need to teach it who that person is. I haven't taught it that yet because I don't know who that is yet, but we can again do what with it what we can. But let's just say that I um, I couldn't identify that, that gentleman over Frank Sinatra's 
uh, shoulder now, but I could later on. And I'll show you what that looks like. So we're able to do bulk confirmation within the facial recognition for photography and for video. So uh, this is an example of Roger Stevens. Um, so Roger Stevens in the upper left two uh, photographs, um, when I scanned those photographs and I flipped over the photo, it had identified all four of the gentlemen. Um, Roger Stevens was my wild card. I didn't know who, what, who that was, um, but because I had, I had that identification in front of me, I could, again, confirm that that was who that face belonged to. But when I went to bulk confirm within the entire system, it found all of these photos of Roger Stevens that I was previously not able to identify when I had cataloged those items in a completely separate folder. So instead of having to rerun caption management on all those photos or remember where I saw that face before, I can just go to the system and ask the system, find this face. And then all I have to do is go through and confirm his face. So again, I love it because I don't have to redo any of my work. Um, and here's an example of facial recognition when it, it pertains to video. So this is um, a, I ran Sydney Poitier's um, broadcast life achievement award show, and it came back with all these folks. Again, a little bit of a different display. And then um, what I really think is great is I can address the asset health of my audio assets because I can see them in a visual form. So I've got what I call my little rat tails and what my bushy cat tails. So the Billy D. Williams asset on the left hand side is very, you can see the blue is very thin. That means that that audio is likely very low in quality and I need to bump it up and make it more robust and usable so that viewers can play the, the content and listen to it without having to like turn their volume all the way up. So that's what I was able to do with Billy Wilder's asset on the right. Um, and what I can do is I can just put a new version on top of that asset. Um, and our, our users will not even know. So once I do uh, bump up the audio for Billy D. Williams, I will put another version on top of it and that little tiny rat tail will turn into a bushy cat tail, which is exactly what we wanna see. So in conclusion, the dam is more than just a central repository. It's really a basis of connecting all of our assets across time, regardless of format. So we can see the iterations of everyone as they age through all of our assets. We've got a lot of young versions of people and a lot of old versions of people, and it really helps connect um, all of that tissue. Um, and then again, it helps my organization understand their history and their legacy and gets it all to their fingertips. Um, I also really love it because it's a self-service atmosphere. There's no gatekeeping. There's no control over. You need to come through me and I dictate what you can see. You can see it all because it's all there and it's all cataloged and searchable and wonderful. Um, and most importantly, it gets the information out of my head and into the hands of my users, which is all I can ask for. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, well, you've certainly got the audience excited about metadata. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and, uh, you know, quite another question that's maybe coming in a couple of different ways here. Um, you, you talk about uh, tools that you're using to speed up the cataloging process. You're obviously staring down like enormous quantities of legacy assets that you have to, you know, catalog. They're only usable and findable once you have cataloged them. How much um, does the work of cataloging end up being? that sort of automation or that that uh, you know machine learning and ai versus how much do you how much per person labor is involved in actually completing the cataloging there is a lot of um human human labor that has to go into it um again as a um as especially in the initial process, right? So I was able to ingest a lot of controlled vocabulary, but we add a lot of it as we find new subjects and things like that. So I do, I am lucky enough to have graduate level interns um, come to me every, mm. um, you know, every term and I'm able to um, harness their abilities and their, their skills to help me catalog all those assets. And how much does that, that, so the human work happened through the tool versus is it offline and you're doing uploads from, you know, things like spreadsheets? 
So um, I was able to ingest a I I was able to ingest a spreadsheet um, of my controlled vocabulary from a, a spreadsheet that I had previously kind of made. Um, so we weren't starting from scratch in that way, um, but we will do a lot of the cataloging through the tool itself online. So um, all of my interns um, that are remote that are working on this project, they will all sign into the system and work within it. How have you found um, you've needed to evolve your metadata and your metadata model over time? Yeah, um, it's definitely changed over time. Um, there was a lot of foundational work that had to happen when I was previously brought on or initially brought on. Um, and so it's always trying to evolve that. And what is really great is that if I have like a um, uh, a piece of controlled vocabulary or a tag or something like that, I can go in and I can edit that tag so that if something changes, I can, you know, let's just say, again, this is a really bad example, like Betty Davis's name gets spelled a completely different way, which mm -hmm. is not going to happen. But I can go in and I can change that so that then any time that it had that previous spelling, it goes back through and it changes everything. So I don't have to go back through and find every iteration and change them one by one. It changes it all at once. Actually, you make me think of a sort of related question there. How much do you um, sort of do things behind the scenes like synonym mapping to just help mitigate for people that misspell through, you know, that through unintentional, like they're, they're not trying to misspell. They just do of they course. Just think something spelled a different way. Of course, I do a little bit of that. Um, I'm a little bit wary of putting in misspellings because again, I want them to be able to spell everything correctly and, you know, but trying to make sure that the users are getting what they need. So I do do the synonym mapping as well, which I really like. And then one of the, the things Roberta talked about in the earlier session was uh, sort of exploring and probing how users were searching, how users were using the system and sort of leveraging those insights and that evolution. You know, how much uh, are you able to sort of uh, probe and mine user behavior to uh, influence uh, your your design, your metadata design, your metadata operation. Yeah, so um, I'm able to run reports so I can see, you know, what kind of search queries my users are doing so that I can see like, okay, this is an important thing or it's not represented um, right now. And maybe I should consider adding that as a, as a tag, right? So I had a lot of um, uh, users looking for like Oscar nominated films or people that were talking about Oscar nominated films. Now that's not something that I was tagging, right? Um, you know, if I had somebody, if I had James Cameron talking about Titanic, I didn't necessarily, I tagged it with Titanic. I didn't necessarily talk, uh, you know, say that this was an Oscar nominated film. So again, seeing how my users are responding and using the system has made me refine my process. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's a related question just came in, Bill, out there in the audience saying, can you relate a person's facial recognition tag to their corresponding subject tags? So the idea that you learn something about uh, an asset and you use that to, you know, mm -hmm. further enhance the metadata, how, how far are you able to sort of push that envelope? Yes. So every photograph, I mean, not necessarily, you can't really like, as far as I, I have not used it yet, if it's possible, but I'm not necessarily linking a face with a subject because what happens is we have a lot of people who come as repeat guests. So we have Steven Spielberg, he's come five times to the American Film Institute to talk. And again, we've got seventies and we've got nineties and we've got two thousands. So it, his, his range of topics is very wide at different moments in time. Um, however, um, I can always add subject metadata to the photography and to the photo assets as well. So not only can I add it to the audio where he's actually, where you can actually hear him speak about that subject, but I can also add it to the corresponding photography as well. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, Nicholas is asking, how do you get predictive text to work for searches? So you talked about the type ahead. How does that end up working? Like how much are you depending on controlled vocabularies versus, is, you know, how much is the system um, using all the information it has to, to do type ahead? And, and how, do you, how do you decide where to draw those lines? Yeah, um, I think more is more in this situation um, for the this particular use case and this particular group of assets, right? Because it's so big. Um, and so um, I, it's, 
right now it's um, really auto auto detecting things that have been tagged. So it's really good about names. Um, and I just need to continue to refine the system so that it also includes all that great subject metadata that we've been putting in in a different field. So that's sort of that's is it fair to say that's in your control to keep sort of expanding the scope of that that predictive text. Yes, yes. And um, I always ask questions of, you know, here's my here's my what I'm doing and I'm doing it the stupid way. Orange Logic, please tell me <laughs> the smart way, because they always know that um, there's always a solution um, from their technological base um, that can help me be more efficient because they'll say like, this is how I'm doing it. And they're like, oh, I've got you. So um, that's really nice to have that relationship um, so that I can just say like, this is my problem. Help me solve it. Mm hmm. Um, how, uh, as you built this ecosystem, how much were you so building from scratch with no pre-existing tools or expectations versus how much were you migrating from like tools or, or earlier dam or dam like capabilities that the organization had? Um, it was really a lot of scratch um, and which was kind of a blessing in disguise, right? You hear the words from scratch and it's terrifying, but it really <laughs> allows you to create it and make it what you need it to be, right? You're not beholden to what came before or trying to maintain a system that doesn't work. Right. So um, whenever I ingest something to the dam, I always make sure that it has a file name consistency, because what I was learning with photography, especially was we had a lot of raw files that were direct from camera and the photographer never renamed them. So it's just ridiculous letters and numbers that don't mean anything. So really having that ability to create something from scratch was really important. Um, I did pull metadata from our library catalog. Um, and then I have a lot of spreadsheets, again, trying to get all the information out of my head and onto a shareable document. Um, so I was able to migrate a lot of that controlled vocabulary that I've been discussing. Yeah, actually, I, I think many of our audience would would say they weren't would not be frightened at all to start from scratch for all the reasons you, you just enumerate. It's is the pre-existing expectations. Pre-existing expectations can be uh, uh, interesting challenges or interesting speed bumps <laughs> along yes. along a project uh, like this. You know, maybe time for just uh, one more question. And yeah, you know, uh, maybe Garrett, feel free to weigh in uh, on this too if you like. Um, you know, how much is uh, an ecosystem like this that you've built? um the the result of just a tool that 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 works that you you deploy uh, uh, off the shelf versus how much sort of intentionality of configuration or even customization do you feel is appropriate to to match your users and match your users expectations I think that you need a healthy balance, right? So I think the more you can customize something, the better off you'll be because that's really configuring something to your system. But I will say that knowing that in, you know, 50 years, we might need to migrate to a new system, right? I hope not, but maybe we will. And so we will need to be able to have the tools to map our metadata fields to other fields if we need to migrate our data. So um, I, I, it's a healthy balance is really good, especially if you can pinpoint, okay, this unique subject field can be mapped to this field over here. So you have some consistency and some, again, future proofing for your metadata. Yeah, and, and from a, I mean, each everybody listening to this has a different scenario, right? Everybody's approaching a different problem, trying to solve a different, or approach a different solution. So having a, I mean, having a tool that's configurable is a blessing, but it also has its, its setbacks, right? There's some time investment, there's a commitment, there's a planning that needs to go into that. And you can't just toss, you know, a note over the fence and hope that, you, you know, a fully polished dam comes back to you on the other side, right? That's just not going mm -hmm. to happen. So I think an important piece there is really collaborating with your partner, whoever that is. And, and to Emily's point, really trying to keep that conversation continuous. Hey, now that we've reached this phase of we have this foundational tool in place, what else can we be deploying to solve this nuanced problem that I have now? And really having a, a healthy relationship with your partner is that much more important down the road than it, as well as up front, right? So that, that's a key element there. Yeah, and that, that makes perfect sense. And, and you know, we're, we're sadly out of time here. I venture there's a number of folks out there in the audience that are quite jealous, Emily, 
of that uh, very smooth and elegant cataloging experience <laughs> that you just uh, showcased here. Um, uh, hopefully there'll be more chances to hear more from both of you at future events. For now, I'm sorry we're out of time, but thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, up next, uh, Lauren Bellamy from IMAX, uh, sharing her damn journey and the insight she's learned along the way. And you can click over to that session now. We'll see you there. <laughs>